Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. This is, okay, Jonah's coming from the west. So it's believed he came in from the west side of the city, went through the city, proclaiming what God said, 40 days till destruction. The people all turn to God. He knows that God is a God that relents. So now he's mad that God would allow for these people to not be destroyed for being his enemies, for being wicked, for being evil. And he goes out the other side of the city to the east side of the city. He builds himself a little shelter that will provide at least a little bit of shade from the blistering sun in the Middle East. And so he goes out there and he sits just to watch the city to see like, will God destroy this thing or what? I want to watch the demise of my enemy. (laughs) Let me just sit here because I want to see God smash them. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant. This is cool. Regularly through uh, the text, we see the Lord gave Jonah his word. The Lord uh, sent the wind. The Lord provided the fish. The Lord here is providing this plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade. So he made this little place for him to be, but it was a, kind of a makeshift shelter with what he could find around him. But there's a better shelter by this, or, or better shade by this plant. And so the Lord even though he's wicked and he's trying to watch the demise of people, provides this plant. He doesn't have to. He decides to. Provides this plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort, to make him more comfortable. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. Very happy. Like exceedingly grateful about this plant. He's exceedingly mad that God would save wicked people and exceedingly happy that God would provide him comfort. (laughs) He's more interested in personal comfort than people's salvation. Mm. Happy about a plant, but mad that God saves. You ever been uncomfortable? You ever been uncomfortable for God's sake? (laughs) Um, When I first started telling people about Jesus, like in my early 20s, I think I was 20 or 21. I think I was 21. I uh, worked with young people, and I served in my local youth ministry. I also worked with this um, group called Young Life that gets into schools and tells young people about Jesus. And in doing so, I had the opportunity to share the gospel with a group of kids. And one of them really hung on to what I said. His dad was like in some sort of pastoral role somewhere. And so they had a plan to do an outreach for young people. And they asked me to be the speaker, which is crazy now that I look back because they didn't know me from anybody really. (laughs) And they, they put together this whole big deal that I would share the gospel and, and they would provide this awesome event for young people to come to. And the, the, the name of the campaign was I Agree With Russ. <laughs> so all through Capitol High School, they put up banners that they got signed off by the ASB. They wore t-shirts that said I Agree With Russ and had a date on them so that people would ask, what is this? What is it about? What are you doing? Oh, we rented out the Valley Athletic Club for an evening. And all young people can come for free and have a great time. There's pools there. There's racquetball. There's basketball. You'll have a great time. And you'll also hear like who this guy Russ, I'll introduce you to this guy Russ. He'll tell you what he believes. And I agree with him. Sounds awesome. So I show up, I'm freaked out, I'm young. I've never really given the message of Jesus to more than a handful of young people. And and I get there and I've put together a message that I feel horrible, not horrible about, but like not confident about. And I go in and I deliver what is to the date, to date, 
the worst <laughs> gospel presentation I've ever given in my life. And I just fumble through words. And, and uh, in the middle of it, I'm just wishing, like, is there a way I could run out the door right now? And it made it even worse that the presentation is, I agree with this guy. <laughs> like, I'm just imagining people afterwards going, like, well, I kind of agree with that guy. But there's, let me give you a better understanding of the gospel. <laughs> and I felt horrible afterwards. I felt horrible. Like, I don't ever want to feel that feeling ever again. And one of the guys, the guy that set it up, came to me later and said, hey, just so you know, afterwards, there was a kid who came over to us and received Jesus as his Lord and Savior after you preached that message. It wrecked me. I was so caught up and everybody thinks I'm an idiot. I went out in my car and I just wept. And in that moment, I just said, God, I don't care how foolish I have to look. God, if I'm the butt of the joke every time, but you would use it to save somebody, I'll be that joker. Like, let me be that guy. Before that, I was caught in my feelings. Like, I don't know if I should ever do that again. Hearing that God would work through a foolish <laughs> presentation, I had to get over my discomfort. It allowed me to get through my discomfort. Because at first, I was worried. I, I thought about not doing it again because it was uncomfortable. Right. Hmm. But it's worth us getting past our comfort so that people would hear the gospel in hopes that some would be saved. Jonah is the opposite. Jonah is, I don't, I'm uncomfortable right now, and my comfort is worth more to me than your grace and mercy extended to others. God, I don't like you put me in that situation. I don't like now how I'm here, but this plant, I'm more happy about my own personal comfort than, God, what you might do in other people. Let's not be Jonah. Let's not be Jonah. It goes on. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm. I love it. God provides a great fish in this story. He provides a plant. He provides a worm. God's sovereign over all this, which chewed the plant so that it withered. <laughs> when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint or was overcome. I get that. Sun on my head is hot. Yeah. But this is crazy. So, so God gives him something that he would be grateful for and also takes it away yeah. so that he could test his heart. He sent the worm to remove the plant to see how Jonah's heart is doing. Hmm. He cares enough to deal with his heart and not just his head. So that he grew faint. He wanted to die. Here he is again. And said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Or what right do you have to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. It's crazy because one of the ways this is read is not just is it right, but what right do you have? And then Jonah's response is, I have the right. I have the right, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. I have the right to be mad about this plant. This plant was for me and for my comfort, and it's gone now. And I have the right to be angry that it would be taken away or that it would be destroyed. What did this plant do? It was just good. The plant was good, and now it's gone Thinks he has the right to be angry about it. Hmm. It's, it's so crazy because in this, again, over and over, Jonah thinks he has the, the right to tell God what is right or not instead of God being right and righteous. Wow. I love in Romans chapter 11, it's called the doxology. 
It says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? It's a good question. Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Jonah is trying to put God basically on the stand. As if Jonah was the one that could bring a, 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 a claim against God, a case against God. As if Jonah could sit in the seat of judge and say, God, I have the right and what are you doing? I think we do this too often. We question what God does as if we're the judge of what's right and wrong and not him. God's the judge. He's the one that sits on the throne. And so here we see Jonah more angry about a plant that would be destroyed than a people that would be destroyed. And God is going to deal with that in him. 